Hello, AB Bio. Welcome to our video lecture for Chapter 11, Mendel and the Gene Idea. So starting with this chapter, we're, we're sort of switching gears into um, a pretty prolonged unit on genetics and genetic problems, which will take us into evolution. Um, so if you didn't like all the, the biochem stuff of the previous chapters, now maybe you'll, you'll enjoy this better. Um, we begin with a picture of yours truly and a pup. Um, that is my puppy dog, Manila. Uh, she's about a year old. Um, we've only had her for about two weeks now, so she's she's very new to the family. Um, I picked this picture not just because it's adorable, but because Gregor Mendel, um, you know, is famous for breeding his pea plants, which we'll get to in a minute. Well, dogs have been, you know, dog breeds are the result of thousands of years of human breeding experiments and human breeding choices. Um, Manila here was a rescue dog. She's a mutt. She's a mix of stuff. But we have dog breeds today because, again, for millennia, humans have been choosing dogs to, to mate to create breeds. So dogs as they exist today are the result of breeding experiments or, or breeding choices that humans have done for, for generations. So, um, you know, in a minute, we're going to begin with um, some backstory on, on Gregor Mendel. So, before Mendel, there were sort of, of two ideas as to how genetics works. There's the blending hypothesis and the particulate hypothesis. The blending hypothesis is that, you know, the genes from mom and dad mix together, kind of like you mix paint to get colors. So a red flower and a white flower making a pink flower would be blending. And there are examples of that, you know, with, with human skin color. Um, you know, if two parents are different ethnicities and they have a child, it's sort of like the, the, the skin color is a mix. The particulate hypothesis would be that, that the units of heredity, which we call genes, are distinct and you don't get blends in between. Um, with Mendel's plants, for example, with the pea plants, they had purple flowers or white flowers only. You didn't get light purple. It was either purple or it was white. Um, Mendel's experiments advocated or, or gave evidence for the particulate mechanism, which that's sort of what, what we mainly go with. We think of the blending examples as the exception to the norm. Um, okay, cool. So let's just get into it. So Gregor Mendel. All right, look at this. Look at this group of studs. So Gregor Mendel was an Austrian monk um, in the mid-19th century, so the, the 1800s. Um, and this picture, this is Mendel right here. He's so cool. He's actually holding a sprig of some kind of plant. Um, this is right, right before their you know, annual Christmas party, I'm sure. Um, look at this guy with his hand on his hip. He's, he's got some sass. Um, but Mendel was, was a, a monk. He was an Austrian monk. Um, he lived in a, a monastery with, again, the monks. And um, Mendel, you know, today we, we, we would call Mendel a, a naturalist. Um, he was interested in discovering how heredity worked by crossing, in this case, pea plants. He also did experiments uh, crossing bees. He did stuff with bees. Um, his data with bees wasn't, isn't really famous data. Um, the, the pea data is what, what, what we talk about. Um, you know, crossing two pea plants that have different traits and getting hybrids, people have been doing that for, for a long time, you know, like, like with dogs. You know, farmers knew that if you wanted really robust corn, you take this breed of corn that gives you, you know, bigger ears, take this breed of corn that resists drought, say, hybridize them together, take the pollen from one and put it on the flowers of another, you know, that, that's nothing new. But how, you know, the rules as to how traits get passed on, that's what Mendel discovers. Um, he's called the father of genetics because the principles of genetics, you know, they're called Mendelian principles, he, he discovers them. Um, peas are a great plant to use. You can get many generations very fast. You know, one pod can have multiple seeds in it. And there's lots of traits that come in only two choices, like purple flowers, white flowers, uh, green seeds, yellow seeds, round seeds, wrinkled seeds, tall plants, short plants. If you use something like skin color in humans, there's a whole spectrum of choices. So using traits where there's only two choices, where it's a binary choice, was very smart. Plus, he could control which plants mated with which plants. Basically, what he would do. Oh, let me go back a second. So he also very intelligently used plants that are called true breeding plants. These are plants that only, like if, if they self-pollinate, like if purple plants breed with purple plants, you only get purple plants. So like a purple plant that could produce white plants, that's not true breeding. 
So true breeding means purple only gives you purple, white only gives you white, and so forth. Today, we would call those plants homozygous versus heterozygous, words that we'll see later in this chapter. Um, yeah, so what he would do, so he would take, um, so the parental generation is called the P generation. He would take the, um, the pollen and he would, he would, you know, in a plant, a little anther, they have the little the tips that produce pollen, um, those are called anther. The central thing is called a, a style, the tip is called a stigma, it has a sticky end, and the pollen, you know, due to the wind or due to insects, stick to the stigma, and then you get seeds down here in the base of the flower. He would take the anther and cut them off, so he controls where the pollen goes. He would use a paintbrush, and in this case, transfer pollen from this plant to the purple plant and get these, in this case, five seeds and plant them. And these are like the children of these two parents. So in this case, the white flower is like the dad because it produced the pollen. The purple flower is like the mom. And then these five plants are like the offspring. Um, the F1 generation, filial, kind of like Philadelphia is a city of brotherly love. Filial refers to the first generation of offspring. So those are called the F1s. If I let these plants self-fertilize, you would get F2s, then F3s, and F4s, and so on, okay? Um, this slide just shows what I just said. Um, a hybrid is what you call it when you cross two different traits. The P1 are the parents, the F1 are the first offspring, and the F2s are the offspring of two F1 plants, or if an F1 plant is self-pollinated, all right? Notice in this diagram, you know, the parents were purple and white, but all the F1s were all purple. So it seems like the white trait just disappeared. Um, it didn't disappear, it's recessive, but it seemed like it disappeared, okay? So let's do a sample cross. So this is, this is what was on the previous slide. Let me just say real quick that trying to teach genetics problems through a video is not ideal. So when I see you guys in class, I hope I'm seeing you guys in class. Um, when I see you in class, we're gonna do a packet of practice genetics problems. Where we're gonna go some, we're gonna go through a bunch of different types with me in front of you on the board, me working them with you, because I realize you listening to me explain this in a video when you can't ask questions is not ideal. So like we're only gonna go through a couple examples on the video because we're gonna do way more in class. All right. So this first cross, the P1 or the P generation was purple and white. You got all purples in the F1. Then he crossed the F1s to get the F2s, and he discovered a couple things. One, the white trait comes back. So it's like it skipped a generation. The white trait was not gone, it was just masked. And two, if you count the number of plants, here you have 705, here you have 224, you get a ratio of three to one, all right? Um, and he kept getting a three to one ratio with, with different traits. Um, he didn't use the term gene, he used the term heritable factor. Today we would use the term gene, so there's the gene for purple and the gene for white. One thing to recognize, Mendel discovers the laws of inheritance. You know, he wasn't using microscopes, he knew nothing about mitosis or meiosis or chromosomes, the word gene didn't even exist. He discovers it by counting pea plants and using math, which is, which is pretty cool. When we go through his conclusions, a lot of them are going to seem obvious to you because you know how chromosomes work and you know, you know, you know, you know what metaphase is of meiosis, right? He did not, okay? Um, if you look at, at he, he looked at, in this case, this chart shows what? Seven different traits, um, flower color, seed color, seed shape. Just look at the numbers and the ratio. 3.15 to 1, seed color yellow to green, 3.01 to 1, seed shape down to wrinkle, 2.96 to 1. Pod shape, 2.95 to 1. Pod color, 2.82 to 1. Flower position, axial means off the side, eternal means off the top, 3.14 to 1. Seed stem link, tall versus dwarf, 2.84 to 1. That 3 to 1 ratio keeps popping up in the F2 generation, all right? Um, the F1, they were 100% whatever the dominant ones. In the F2s, you keep getting back that 3 to 1 ratio. So his conclusions, you know, today, these seem obvious because we know how meiosis works, right? Um, back in the day, this was, this was new. Um, he published his work in like the 1850s, 1860s, and it's not taken that seriously because no one sees much value in it. People already knew that you could, you could cross plants. It's not till the turn of the century. Um, in the early 20th century, he's long dead. When his work is sort of rediscovered and people realize how you know, foundational this is, this is the rules of inheritance. 
and you know he's appreciated much much later long after he is he is dead um so his first conclusion there are alternative versions of genes he didn't use the word genes but we are which account for variation these alternative versions are called alleles this is a, a word that you've probably seen before in maybe ninth grade bio but we haven't seen it um so far in av bio you need to know this word alleles so what are the different alleles for eye color in humans? There's blue, there's brown, there's black, there's green, there's hazel. For hair color, there's black, there's blonde, there's red, there's brown. Those are the different versions. Now, how many copies of a given gene do you have? You have two copies of every gene, right? One from mom, one from dad. But how many alleles are possible? In the case of his plants, it was only two. But for most traits, it's way more than two, all right? So you have two copies. They might be the same thing. They could both be for blue eyes, but they could be for different copies of the gene, different alleles. Um, and again, where the gene is located is the same on, on whatever chromosome it is, but the version you have might be different. This is a purple allele for flowers. This is a white allele for flowers. This is from the dad plant for the mom plant. They're in the same position on the chromosome, but they just have different instructions. Um, number two, this one's obvious. Right, for each character, an organism inherits two alleles, one from mom, one from dad. Number three, hopefully is obvious, when the, if the two allele, you know, if they're the same, end of story. If it's big P, big P, you're purple. If they're different, the dominant trait masks the recessive trait. There's no blending in Mendel's conclusions. It's dominant or it's recessive, all right? And his fourth conclusion, he called the law of, well, now we call it the law of segregation. I'm not sure if he called it that or not. But basically he says that the two alleles um, when you make egg and sperm, they separate and end up in different, different gametes. So like if I'm big B, little b for eye color, um, sperm that are produced either get a big B or they get a little b. Now today we would say a diploid cell becomes haploid, right? Um, a common AP question. So during what phase of meiosis does the law of segregation actually happen? Like when do those, when do those alleles actually separate? And the answer is anaphase one, not anaphase two. In anaphase two, they're just copies separating. In anaphase one is when actually the, the homologous pairs separate. So Mendel's law of segregation happens in anaphase one of meiosis. That's an important distinction to make. All right, this just shows the same, um, the same cross that, that he did with, with the three to one ratio. What I wanna do now, um, and again, this is not ideal because this, this is better if I was in front of you is I wanna go through that cross as if it were a Punnett square problem. So we have, we have purple and white. The first thing you do, this is, this is my chicken scratch, the way I worked it out. The first thing you do is you assign letters for each allele and you always use the first letter of the dominant trait, which is purple. So I use big P for purple and little p for white. Do not use P and W for reasons we'll get to later. Do not use different letters. When I do dihybrid crosses, having different letters, that's, that's a bad idea. Um, and if you're doing a letter, like my handwriting can be kind of trashy, so I put a little like <clears throat> curly, whatever you want to call that, a little spooky thingy on my P just to make sure that I don't get them confused with, with the big P. So big P is purple, little P is white. The parents were true breeding purple and white okay, because the parents have two copies. The, the purple is big P, big P, the white is little P, little P. Um, to do the F1, I don't need to do a Punnett square, like this plant can give a big P, this plant can give a little P, so all my F1s are big P, little P, that's simple. And Mendel got purple for all his F1s, remember? Now, I'm going to cross two F1 plants, big P, little P, big P, little P, to get my F2s, and to do that, I need that bar to go away. To do that, um, actually, this is, I need my, I need my cursor. So, this plant can give a big P or a little P. So I put the big P there. I put the little P there. This plant can give a big P or a little P. I put a big P there and I put a little P there. All right. So what's on the top and the side of a Punnett square are the different alleles from the F1s. What's inside the four boxes are the F2 possibilities. So that's a big P, big P. That's a big P, little P. That's a big P, little P. That's a little P, little P. Um, the first one, so that's purple, that's purple, it's heterozygous, but you know, the dominant mass, the recessive, that's purple, and that one right there, bottom right, is white. So there's three ways to be purple, one way to be white, that's an F, that's a, that's a three to one ratio in my F2s. 
So that's why mathematically Mendel kept getting a three to one ratio. Okay. Um, vocabulary, we've, I've been using these terms. Homozygous means the two alleles are the same, either big P, big P, or little P, little P. Um, to distinguish between them, you say homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. So big P, big P is homozygous dominant. Little P, little P is homozygous recessive. Heterozygous is if the letters are different. So big P, little P, there's only one way to be heterozygous, right? Phenotype and genotype. Phenotype is the term for what the organism looks like. So if I say that I have blue eyes, I'm telling you my phenotype. Genotype is what the letters are, what the genetic makeup is. So if I say that I'm big B, or if I say that I'm sorry, little b, little b for eye color, that, that is giving the genotype. If you know what the letters stand for, if I give you the genotype, can you tell me the phenotype? The answer is yes, right? Because you know what the letters mean. If I give you the phenotype, can you give me the genotype? Think to yourself, can I? Well, I, sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. If it's recessive and I give you the phenotype, the genotype is the only way to be, it's both the, both the lowercase letters. If you're dominant, you could be big, big or big little. So if I give you the genotype, you can make it the phenotype always, if you know what the letters stand for. Phenotype to genotype works sometimes, sometimes it doesn't, okay? This just shows Mendel, you know, there were four choices, three were purple, one was homozygous dominant, two were heterozygous. Go back and look at my Punnett square. Um, and one was almost, I guess, recessive, so three to one ratio. Here it says ratio one to two to one. That's looking at genotypes. So one big P, little P, two big, I'm sorry, one big P, big P, two big P, little P's, and one little P, little P. So the ratio of phenotypes, that bar needs to go away. There we go. The ratio of phenotypes was three to one. The ratio of genotypes was one to two to one. Okay. So, question. If I have a purple, if you have a white plant, what's the genotype? Little p, little p, done. If I have a purple plant, is there a way to tell what the phenotype is? By looking at it, you can't tell. But you can do what's called a test cross. A test cross is when you cross a plant or any organism with a recessive. So say I have a purple plant and I cross it with a little p, little p, right? If that purple plant was big P, big P, all the baby plants should be purple, right? If the purple plant was big P, little P, see if you can do this in your head. If it was big P, little P, crossed with little P, little P, what percentage should be purple and white? It should be 50-50. It should be a one-to-one -one ratio. So doing a test cross allows you to determine what the genotype is of a dominant tree. This just shows. So I have a dominant flower. Is it big P, big P, or big P, little P? Cross it with recessive. If it's big P, little P, they're all purple. If it's big P, little P, half are purple and half are white. Um, the law of independent assortment. So he has two laws of inheritance. Um, the law of independent assortment, I'm sorry, the law of segregation was the one that we discussed previously during anaphase one when the traits separate. The law of independent assortment, he used the term down here, each pair of alleles segregate independently of each other. So like what the genes for eye color do and what the genes for hair color do don't affect one another. Um, if two genes are on the same chromosome, that can be a problem. If eye color and hair color are on the same chromosome, you know, they can't physically separate, although they can be a crossing over. That's that, we're gonna get to that in chapter 12, right? Um, what phase of meiosis is independent assortment? It's metaphase one of meiosis, right? That's when they line up and whether it's mom's chromosomes or dad's chromosomes, it's just random. So common questions. The first law of, of, of Mendel's first law of genetics is the um, law of segregation. That's anaphase one of meiosis. His second law, the law of independent assortment is metaphase one of meiosis. Okay, so a dihybrid cross like this one, um, this is something that we need to practice several times in class. We're just going to kind of go through how you do one briefly on the video. So a dihybrid cross is when you track more than one trait at the same time. Um, in this case, you're tracking two traits. So here I have a scenario where I have yellow versus green seeds, and I'm going to use capital Y for that trait. Um, lowercase y is for green. And then round versus wrinkled seeds. Big R is round, little r is wrinkled. And I'm going to tell you that the parents are yellow and round, and I'm giving you the genotype and green and wrinkled, and I'm giving you the genotype. Um, what I want, ultimately, is the ratio of the F2s. 
Okay, so this is my chicken scratch of doing the problem. So let's just go through this. So here's what the parents are, right? This is just from the previous slide. Um, predicting the F1s is easy because, you know, each, each parent gives one Y and they give one R. So this parent can only give a big Y. This parent can only give a little Y. So it's big Y, little Y. Same with the R's. So with these two parents, the only kind of uh, P they can produce would be big Y, little Y, big R, little R which would look like a yellow round um, seed, right? So the F1s are easy, all right? Now, to get the F2s, now I'm gonna cross two F1 plants, which I know what the F1s are because I just did it. And to do that, you have to do a dihybrid cross. Um, again, we're gonna do a bunch of these in class and there are, there are patterns that help you figure out how to do this. So it's not always this hard. Um, you don't always have to do a four by four box like this. So the first thing that I do, so here's what the parents are, and I'm drawing an arrow to what I, I did here. So you need to figure out the possible gametes that the F1s can produce. Now remember that gametes are haploid. So gametes have one Y and they have one R. So you know both parents are the same. So I'm doing this once because they're the same. So this, this parent could produce an egg or sperm with a big Y and a big R, with a big Y and a little R, with a little y and a big R, or a little y and a little r. So there's four possible gametes that this parent can make, and the other parent's the same. So here I've written on the top the four gametes the first plant can make and the four that the second plant can make. Notice gametes are haploid. So there's one y and there's one r. Each box in the four by four grid um, has two y's and two r's because this represents F2 p's. Um, and I just, you know, I took time and I just crossed them. So, you know, this box represents this cross, this box represents that cross. This is not something to rush through. If you're doing these in class or on a test, you need to make sure you don't make a careless mistake. Um, and there's, there's 16 possibilities, right? Um, that's yellow round, 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 that's yellow, round, that's yellow um, wrinkled, that's yellow round, that's yellow wrinkled. Yellow round, yellow round, um, green round, green round, yellow round, yellow wrinkled, green round, and green wrinkled. All right. Um, and if you if you count what I just did, there's nine yellow round, three yellow wrinkled, three green and round, one green and wrinkled, which gives me a nine to three to three to one ratio. Um, the magic ratio for a monohybrid cross in the F2s was three to one. The magic ratio for a dihybrid cross in the F2s is nine to three to three to one. You need to have that memorized. That, those ratios work when the parents, listen to me, when the parents are heterozygous. Here, are the parents heterozygous? Yes. This is a dihybrid cross? Yes, so it's nine to three to three to one. Every dihybrid cross won't be nine, three, three, one. It only works that way if the parents are both heterozygous, okay? This slide is the, it's the same thing. This is just the book's visualization of it. And you can see here, they've also like put in images. So that's yellow and round, that's green and round, just so that you can see, you can see them visually. Again, we're gonna do a bunch of these in class to practice. And that's how you really learn how to do these is the practice, not through me showing you on a video. But that's a good introduction, right? Okay, so the laws of probability. So you don't have to do a Punnett square for all of these questions. There's usually simpler ways to do it. There are two laws of probability, the law of addition, the law of multiplication, that if you use them appropriately, can get you the correct answer without doing the Punnett square. So let's do some very easy sample problems involving um, flipping coins. So the rule of multiplication, if, um, if multiple things have to happen for an event to take place, you find the probability of each individual event and you multiply them together, okay? So, sample problem. What is the probability of tossing a coin twice and getting heads both times? How many things have to happen for that to happen? Well, two things. You toss the coin once and it's heads, toss the coin a second time and it's heads. The chances of the first coin being heads is a half, right? Second coin being heads is a half. They both have to happen, so you multiply them to get a fourth, all right? Same question asked differently. Um, 
actually be even easier. What are the chances that a couple has a kid and it's a boy? Okay, that's a half, right? Because it's boy and girl. What are the chances that they have a boy and that then they have another boy? That they have two boys. Well, the first kid is a boy. The gender of the first kid doesn't affect the gender of the second kid. So the second kid, being a boy, is also a half. You multiply them and it's a fourth. What are the chances that couple has three kids and they're all girls, right? First kid a girl is a half, then a half, then a half. So the answer is an eighth, all right? Having three kids, them all being girls, is the chances are one out of eight, all right? Um, what about having a boy, then a boy, then a girl? Well, that's still one out of eight because each one is a half, all right? Um, this shows a Punnett square way of doing the question. Don't worry about this. Um, the rule of addition, so if there's more than one way that, it, that an event can happen, if you can happen multiple different ways, you find the chances of each individual way and then you add those together. All right, let's do an example. What are the chances of tossing two coins at the same time and getting one heads and one tails, right? There's two ways to do that. You could get a heads and a tails or you could get a tails and a heads, all right? What are the chances of this first way of getting of, of one coin being a heads and one coin being a tails? Well, each coin's a half, so the chances of getting heads tails is a fourth. The chances of getting tails heads is a fourth. All right, both those are legitimate ways of getting one heads and one tails. So you add those together, you get two fourths, which is a half. Okay. Um, if things can happen more than one way, you add the probabilities of each individual. Um, a combo example, what are the chances of tossing a coin four times and getting two heads and two tails in any sequence? What I have to do here, and you can see I've written it out, is write out each different way that I can get two heads and two tails. And if you look at my, my work, there's six ways of getting two heads and two tails. The first one is heads, heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails. You can read these yourself. Each individual way, the chances is one sixteenth. Because, you know, that's a half, that's a half, that's a half, that's a half. A half um, times itself four times is one sixteenth, right? Now, because there's six ways that I can do it, you add those probabilities, that's six sixteenths, which reduces down to three eighths, okay? All right. Um, th th this question looks really complicated. It's actually not. Um, a tri-hybrid cross would be gosh, an eight by eight box, and we're never gonna do an eight by eight box. That's just crazy. So we're gonna do this question using the rules of probability. For the cross, big A, little a, big B, little b, big C, little c, cross itself, what is the probability of getting little a, little a, little, little b, little b, little c, little c? So the way, it, look what I have written out here. Um, to get little a, little a, so this individual, genotype, what are the chances that this individual gives a little a? Well, it's a half. What are the chances this one gives a little a? It's a half. Times them together, the chances of getting little a, little a is a fourth, right? Same thing with the big B, little b. The chance of that genotype and that genotype producing little b, little b is a fourth. And the same with little c, little c, all right? Do all three of these things have to happen? They do, so we use the rule of multiplication. A fourth times a fourth times a fourth is one sixty-fourth. So imagine doing this cross with an eight by eight box. How many boxes, picture in your head, would be would be that genotype? It would only be the box at the bottom right, which is one out of sixty-four. Okay? All right, that, that's pretty meta. So if you need to think about that, pause it and go back and think about that. Um, this sample problem. I'm not gonna go through this and I'm just gonna show you the answer. I have two genotypes. What is the chances of an offspring showing at least two recessive traits? So having either little p, little p, little y, little y, or little r, little r. Um, I'm just gonna show you the answer. So there's five different ways of having at least two recessive traits, right? You can look at them. This is just from the textbook. You get the chances of each of these happening using the rule of multiplication. You have the chances of each one, you add these together and you end up with, with three eighths. A question like this, this would, I don't think the AP exam would give you one like this because this, this honestly, you have about like a minute or so per question, a minute, 12 seconds, or that's not right. It's about, about a minute per question. 
and this would take more than a minute. So, you know, a question like this, I think, is more applicable than a question like this, but it's worth going through these to practice your multiplication and division uh, or your probability laws uh, to practice those skills. Okay, so that was great. Mendel, father of genetics, super important dude. But there are examples that go beyond Mendelian genetics. There are exceptions. And we're going to go through the exceptions now. Um, so let's just go through them. So incomplete dominance. So this is blending. This is what this is what Mendel didn't found. He found the particulate hypothesis was was correct. Well, with snapdragons, you can be red, you can be white, and if you mix them together, you actually get pink. It's like mixing paint. The Punnett square problems, you do them the exact same way, but a heterozygous genotype isn't dominant. It's a blending of the two. And we're going to do sample ones like this in class. Codominance is when both alleles are dominant. So with human blood types, you, know, you can be type A, you can be type B, or you can be type AB. They're actually both dominant. Um, this leads to a good question, and this slide is super important. Don't, don't go through this too fast. Think about this. And it's a, it's a question of what exactly, therefore, is dominance, right? Is it really that one trait masks another trait? And the answer really oftentimes is that it, it's not. And I, I want to give you an example. So Tay-Sachs disease is a disease. It's a recessive disease. Um, the brain cannot metabolize lipids properly. Um, babies who are born with this, um, they, they, don't, um, they eventually pass away. I don't, I don't know if there are good treatments for Tay-Sachs disease. It's a, it's a tragic disease. We're using the letter N because the dominant trait is being normal, right? Um, the recessive trait is having Tay-Sachs disease. Now, if you're a big N, big N, and what, what this is, is it, it's a gene that codes for an enzyme that if you have Tay-Sachs disease, you do produce the enzyme, but you produce a non-functional version, so the shape is wrong and it doesn't work right. If you're big N, big N, both your alleles for that enzyme are fine, you're, you're totally good. If you're little and little and both of your versions of the gene are the incorrect version, you have Tay-Sachs disease. If you're big and little and, all right, you know, you're normal, you don't have the disease, but actually both genes are expressed and half of that enzyme that the body produces is non-functional, but the other half is functional and it's enough to where you're, you know, typically normal. So this is actually codominance because both versions of the gene are being expressed and the, the recessive version doesn't work, um, but you have enough of the dominant version to where overall you appear dominant. So is the dominant masking the recessive? Phenotypically, it looks like it is, but genetically, it's actually not, all right? In most genetic disorders like this, you know, if you're a carrier, you're normal, you don't have the disease, but you're still making some protein product that is incorrect. Um, sickle cell anemia is, is an, another example. If you're a carrier for sickle cell anemia, half your red blood cells are, are faulty, but you have enough that are correct that you don't have the disease. Um, but you still make some hemoglobin that's the wrong shape, okay? This last point, I wanna read this out loud. On the molecular level, this is actually codominance because the level of enzyme activity is lower for a big N little N person than a big N big N person. That needs to make sense to you very clear. Um, if that explains what dominance actually is. Okay, moving on. The frequency of dominant alleles, there's this idea that the dominant trait's more common. Um, good statistic. So polydactyly is having six fingers. Um, one out of every 400 babies in the US is born with an extra finger or toe, and that's actually the dominant trait. Um, having five fingers, or five toes on a hand is actually the recessive trait, but it's way more common than the dominant trait, so we see more of it in our population. So the idea that dominant is more common is not true. Multiple alleles, so this is going through the blood typing group again. Um, you know, if you have the big A, big A, you're type A, big B, big B, you're type B. If you have big A, big B, you're type AB, they're both expressed. If the alleles are for big AO, that's type A, big B O is type B, or big O, big O is type O. So there's actually three different sort of versions of the gene, and they code for surface features, surface carbohydrates on your red blood cells. This picture kind of shows them well. 
Um, the I in this slide, the I stands for immunoglobin. Um, if you forget that, we're, just, we're talking about big A, big B. So we have immunoglobin A, immunoglobin B, and the little I means you don't make it at all. So your, your surface carbohydrates aren't there. Um, so you have the A, you have the B, or you have none. That's what shows a triangle, a circle, or none. So if your immunoglobin A, you, know, you can read this, or, or A with a little I, you have the A surface feature. B, you have the B. A, B, you have both of them. And I, little I, you have none of them. So that's A, B, A, B, or O. So there's multiple different alleles that code for the ABO blood group and type. All right. With Mendel's things, there were two, purple or white, round or wrinkled. Usually there's more than two. Pleiotropy is just a word that means um, a gene can have more than one effect. So like if you have cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia, it's not like one gene has one effect. You have a whole syndrome of effects because again, most genes, well, lots of genes have multiple effects. The word for that is pleiotropy. That's probably a new word for you. Epistasis is the concept of a gene, one gene affecting another gene. Um, the best example is in Labrador retrievers, there's, there are genes for what color the dog is, all right? Um, and the scenario we're going to go through, a big B is black and a little B is brown. So, you know, big B, big B is black, little B, little B is brown. You can practice this in your head. Well, there's another gene elsewhere that codes for does the dog produce pigment at all? And if you have the recessive form of that gene, if you don't produce pigment at all, then you're the golden color, right? So you could genetically be big B, big B, but if you don't produce pigment at all, you're the golden right? Look at this diagram. So like, you know, this dog is black and it makes pigment. That's the E version. Um, this dog should be black, but it's recessive for making pigment at all. So it overall appears golden. And the ratio here is nine to three to four, which tells you, you know, these are heterozygous parents, right? So it should be nine, three, three, one. Well, it's an exception to Mendel's rules because it's, it's epistasis. Um, this dog, this last dog, should be brown, but it doesn't make pigment at all, so it's golden. Okay? Cool. Polygenic inheritance is just if you have more than one gene that affects a trait, like skin color. There are multiple genes that affect skin color, which is why there's the sort of spectrum of skin color among humans. It's not just one gene. All right? Um, these two slides, these are from your book. These just review all the exceptions to Mendel's rules, which you need to know. So take some time just to review these. Um, the whole nature versus nurture debate, you can debate this for hours. Um, so like human height, all right, let's just go through a trade. Is human height nature or is it nurture? Well, the answer with most things is it's both, right? There are genes that will influence how tall that you grow. Right, I, I do not have the genes to be six foot tall. I just don't have those genes, right? However, like if you're a kid and I don't feed you properly, you will not grow as tall. So nurture means like, you know, how are you treated? How are you nurtured after your genetics are set? Um, if you're malnourished, you won't grow. Um, one reason why the average human height has increased since, you know, ancient Egypt, just that our diet's much better than it was even, even a hundred years ago. People are taller now than they were a century ago because we, at least in, in the developed world, have much better diets than we did a hundred years ago. So people grow taller. So is it nature or nurture? Well, it's, it's varying degrees of both. Um, so, okay, pedigrees. So tracking traits in humans like doing genetic studies with fruit flies or peas, you know, I can get a new generation in a short period of time with humans, it takes a long time to get new generations. So we use pedigrees to track traits. Um, we're gonna do lots of these in class. A pedigree like, like this one, uh, squares are male, circles are females, the shaded shape means it has whatever the trait is. Um, this slide shows widow's peak, and the slide gives the answer away, but I want you to pretend like you don't know the answer. So the question is, is Widow's Peak a dominant trait or a recessive trait? Um, you know, you, you could analyze this and try and figure it out. The, the trick that I use to see is a trait dominant or, or is it recessive, and this almost always works, is fine. So, okay, you know, you get the idea. These two people, this is a couple, and they had these two kids. 
right? So like this couple had four kids. These kids are all siblings. And then this boy married that girl and had these kids. That's probably obvious to you. So here's the trick. Find two parents that are exactly the same phenotypically, like they're both dominant but recessive, and look at their offspring, all right? These two parents are both the same, all right? And they had a kid that was different. They had a kid that was recessive and a kid that's dominant. The only way for that to happen is if the trait is dominant, all right? I'll show you one where it's recessive on the next slide. If two parents that are the same have kids that are different, that trait must be a dominant trait, all right? Both of these, actually, let, let me clarify that. Both these parents are the same and they have the disease, they have the trait, they have the widow's peak. So if two parents that have the trait have kids that don't have the trait, that's a better way of saying it. That means the trait's dominant. By comparison, look at this one. This one is showing a pedigree for attached versus free earlobes. Um, here I have two parents that do not have the trait. They do not have the trait, right? But they have a kid that does have the trait. For that to happen, the trait has to be recessive. It has to be masked. So if two parents, or, or look at these two parents. If two parents that don't have a trait have kids that do have the trait, it means the trait is recessive. So like, like looking at this coupling, I don't find very useful. Looking at this coupling or this coupling, I find useful. So just let me say that again. Here I have two parents that have the trait. They have a kid that doesn't have the trait. It's gotta be dominant. Here I have two parents who don't have the trait. They have a kid that does have the trait. It has to be recessive. Kind of like think and think through that logically and that, that little trick usually always works and it, it makes sense once you reason it out. Um, you know, I used the word carrier a minute ago. So most genetic diseases are recessive, um, which means that version of the gene is non-functional. Like it might make a protein, but the protein doesn't work. Um, if you're heterozygous, you know, you're phenotypically normal, but half of whatever the trait is, half of the protein you make is faulty. So you don't have the disease, but you can pass it on, which is what a carrier is. Um, this just shows, this shows a Punnett square for albinism. So both of these parents are carriers for albinism, right? Um, that offspring's fine, that one's fine, that one's fine. This one is an albino. So if two parents, of, you know, this is a three to one ratio, right? Both parents are heterozygous, it's three to one normal to, um, in this case, albino. Um, the AP exam isn't gonna ask you for specific details about diseases, like what is cystic fibrosis, but let's, it's worth going through this because they could give these to you as a scenario. Cystic fibrosis is the most lethal genetic disorder in the United States. It's a defect, so in your lungs, you have chlorine transport ions that, that pump chlorine, um, I believe out of the cell and people that have cystic fibrosis, those, pro those protein pumps or the, their chlorine pumps, the pumps are proteins, they're pumping chlorine, do not work right. So the, the cell can't pump chlorine properly and where chlorine is, you know, water goes due to osmosis, water follows solute. So basically you, you build up or you build up mucus in your lungs because you have lots of water, you know, building up where the ions are and the mucus disrupts normal oxygen flow through your lungs. So you, you cough a lot, you hack a lot, you don't, um, you don't get oxygen efficiently. If you have lots of mucus, you know, bacteria love mucus. You get lots of lung infections. Um, and you know, eventually there are, there are treatments for it, but there's no cure. Without, the, without getting treatments, you would eventually die. Although you, you can live into adulthood if you have cystic fibrosis. Sickle cell anemia. We've discussed this before, affects one out of every 400 African Americans. So why sickle cell trait is more common in African American or African populations, we're gonna see why that is in a later chapter. Um, it, it doesn't relate to your skin color, it just relates to where that trait originated, which was in Africa, because it gives you resistance to malaria, which is more common in Africa um, than it is in, um, like you know, in, in, in Norway, which has a more traditional white population, you don't have malaria because it's it's colder, right? So the, the the malaria trait is more common where originally they were more dark skinned people. But we're going to come back to that in a later chapter. Um, 
So, you know, it's, you have the wrong shape of your blood cells. You get, you're weak, you get pain, the blood cells don't flow properly, you're fatigued, you can't carry oxygen. This is a, a recessive trait too. Um, uh, we, we discussed the idea of being, um, if, you know, if you have sickle cell, that, that stings, but you're, you're resistant to malaria because the pathogen that carries malaria doesn't infect blood cells that are sickle shaped nearly as well. So if you're a heterozygous, that's the best of both worlds. You, you, know, you don't have sickle cell, you're phenotypically normal, but half of your blood cells are the sickle shape. So you know, you're less likely to get malaria. So you know, if you're a population evolving in, in Africa and you're a carrier for sickle cell, you don't get malaria and you don't have sickle cell. That's called a heterozygote advantage, where it's actually better to be the heterozygous version. That, that concept we're going to come back to when we do evolution later. Um, some traits are dominant. This is a uh, Punnett square showing achondroplasia, which is a form of dwarfism. It's dominant. So here I have um, a parent. So this parent on top of the Punnett square is heterozygous, which means they exhibit dwarfism with a mom that was normal. Um, and half their kids would have dwarfism if you look at the Punnett square. Uh, most genetic disorders are recessive, but some can be dominant. Um, okay, cool. Huntington's disease is a degenerative disease that affects people usually in their 30s or later. It's a fatal disorder. Um, your nerves uh, degenerate, which makes your muscles degenerate. You'll eventually die from it. There's, there's no cure for it. Um, it doesn't it doesn't, ex it doesn't show itself until you're about 35 to 45, which means at that point, you've probably already had offspring who are very likely to maybe get the disease too. So it's a very tragic condition. Um, and it's a dominant disorder. Co-sanguinity is just a word for mating between close relatives. Um, usually you discuss the Queen Victoria's pedigree with Europe and how she was a carrier for hemophilia. And she had, you know, nine kids, or how many kids she had, and she married them all to different royal families in Europe. Um, one of her kids wound up in the, the Russian royal family, the Tsar. And, you know, they had lots of hemophilia in that line. Um, if you're breeding between close relatives, think of it sort of like any recessive traits that are in that gene pool get concentrated. You know, the chances of someone, of two people having a kid who are, who are both carriers for hemophilia, that, that's pretty low. Um, if you're related and your gene pool has hemophilia in it, it's just more likely. Multifactorial diseases are diseases that have many factors. Think of like um, diabetes, alcoholism, mental illnesses, cancer, heart disease, where there's a genetic component, but there's also an environmental component. So like, are there genes that might lead to you getting cancer? There are, but you know, sunburns give you cancer too. Are there, you know, are there genes that might mean you're going to get diabetes? There are, but having a poor diet and being uh, overweight can also lead to diabetes. So there's more than one factor that causes it. Lifestyle obviously has a tremendous impact on things like that. Okay, so that was a super long chapter. Um, we went through that as, as quick as I could. Um, again, we will do some practice genetics problems in class. Um, anyway, hope that was helpful. I will see you guys next time.